Welcome to Church Unscripted. This week, if you're with us, the first thing you can do is subscribe to our channel so you can get more of these um, episodes as they come out and on every Wednesday. And the other part of it is we want you to like and then also hit the bell below to get notified when another one of the podcasts comes out. Um, This weekend, we were talking about um, illegitimate or the accusation of being illegitimate. And so I really appreciated a lot of what what you said this weekend, Pastor Eric. And I, I just called you Pastor Eric. Oh, nah, it's kind of so weird. weird. Oh. Yeah, yeah, don't call Eric, me. Just say Eric. Eric, Eric. all right. That'll work. And so uh, when you were talking, we've been, we've been in John chapter eight mm-hmm. and we've been looking through scripture there. And I kept thinking in your sermon Sunday because you were talking about the relationship between Jesus and his heavenly father and how they were making him illegitimized in that I kept thinking about how some of us have a kind of messed up picture of what it means to be a dad or a heavenly father. And I really think that that's something that we struggle with in our relationship with our heavenly father. And so some of us have had a biological dad that's either absent or abusive. And so how can we overcome the feelings that we have towards our earthly father? I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah, that's, that, a that's, a, that's, a, that, that's not a great introductory question. That's I know. Like dive into I, the deep I, end I, right up front. Basically, so, we just dove into yeah, the ocean, you did. okay? <laughs> you did, you did. But I tell you what, that's probably one of the more relevant questions that you can ask, especially in a conversation like this, because um, I, don't, I don't know how many, what, what percentage of our people, if we're just looking at Brookside, I don't know what percentage of our people had a father that was abusive or abandoned them or absent. But I do think that there's something about uh, our fathers or earthly fathers simply due to the fact that they are, they are humans and yeah. fallen because of sin, just like the rest of us, that, that because of whatever that is, gives us something of an obscure or inaccurate image of who God is. And so uh, whether it's an abandonment, an absent uh, father or an abusive father, um, that's an extreme form of it. But I think generally speaking, we're going to have to find a way to overcome whatever it is that our earthly fathers did to obscure our image of God. And I think the first way to do that is to really to, to just to look at Jesus. I mean, Jesus is clear. If you know me, then you know the father. And the more you do this, the older you get, the more you can recognize the difference between your earthly father and your heavenly father, but he can also recognize the similarities. And I would like to suggest that, that hopefully for most of us, when you have a clear image of who your father is and heavenly father is, that there's more similarities in the way that your father raised you than dissimilarities. And, and that's, what I'm, I'm, that's what I'm grateful for the older I get from my own father and hopefully for what my, my kids say about me uh, when they get older. But I think the best way to start is just by keeping your eyes on Jesus and learn from him the way the father reacts and responds and relates to us. Uh, and then you, you're probably gonna have to go through some forgiveness. If you need to go through counseling, it's, okay, I, I saw that my dad abused me. Um, uh, aside from simply going to that father and saying, hey, I just want you to know you hurt me. You're gonna have to deal with those emotional pain, that mental pain uh, through counseling, um, therapy. Um, and it can help uh, your relationship with your heavenly father. Absolutely, in, 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 absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, so th- that's a really hard question. I but, know, I... I, when I was listening Sunday and you were talking about illegitimate, I just yeah. kept thinking a lot of us may be sitting here thinking we're illegitimate mm-hmm. because of how we've been treated sure. by our earthly father. Sure. Courtney, what, what thoughts on that do you have? I mean, I know I, I dove into the deep end first and you know, some of my questions are lighter after this. Okay, <laughs> so, great. So we'll just get it, it over easier. with then. <laughs> No, it is really a deep topic. And I feel like even if your father did really well, they're still human. Like there's still that level of they're not perfect and there are extreme cases. And then there's just, I had a human father. So I think along with therapy, if you really were hurt, um, you really need to dive into who am I to my heavenly father? What is my identity? I know we talked Mm -hmm. about that a lot last week, but understanding his great love for me, um, it doesn't really matter how my, earthly father loved me is so long as I can also grasp onto that kind of love that he has for me, that he has for all of us and that we are his children and we are his beloved. So I think when I, when that's my suggestion, yes, do therapy because that really helps in the healing process, but focus on who you are to the God who created everything. I agree. Courtney, I'm like, <laughs> I'm listening to this. I'm like, 
Awesome, awesome. Yeah. I uh, can I tell you guys a little bit story about my dad? Yeah, yeah, please. About this as please we were do. preparing. So, so uh, in John chapter eight, you mentioned already when Jesus answered, "You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also." And so, there's a deep uh, knownness mm -hmm. to our relationship with Jesus. And so, I had a relationship with my dad where he. Um, over time, we grew distant because I just never could do anything right. You ever have that feeling? I mean, we've all had some moment where we think a parent thinks, well, you can't do anything right. I don't know what to do. And our relationship became distant. And I remember the point where God transformed our relationship into something very beautiful. And that was when I started changing what my expectations were for him to what was realistic based on his a humanity or mm -hmm. earth, or earthly fatherness. I don't know how you want to say it, but just, just the reality of, okay, he's not going to be who I want him to be because who I want him to be is not who he is. And it's the same thing with our identity. Sometimes we want to be someone that we're not, but God's made us in the way we are. And so I think it's, it's sometimes fair in our relation with our heavenly father to, what does Jesus say he is? What does scripture say he is? But he's not something that he doesn't say he is. And so um, I think our heavenly father and our earthly father can get, um, it can get mixed a little bit. So my relation with my dad got a lot better. And then when I had to go through the grief of losing him, he passed away. The response I was able to have was much healthier. I grieved, of course, but in essence, I realized like I have a peace now. I understand that my heavenly father gave me my earthly father for a period of time. And then now he's gone. And, and I know like listening to your sermon on Sunday, I thought of all the people that maybe are grieving a loss of a parent or grieving a loss of their father, or they, they never knew who their father was, or maybe they recently found out who their father was and the, the gap that that is. So I just, I just think that maybe some of us, and maybe this is where the question lies, I'm doing talking now, but maybe the question is, for those of us that really don't have a picture of a father, I mean, there is a blank slate. What, where should we start to learn about our heavenly father? Maybe that's too big of a question. Mm. But like when I go to scripture, like where should I go? What should I like? You're learn? talking about like what book or what? Oh chapter yeah, even Bible book or? chapter or just how do I learn more about my heavenly father? If I, I, I know there's some people listening yeah. or watching that just have no concept. Right. Outside, I know God loves me. I know Jesus raised from the dead. I mean, just that base knowledge of what is our heavenly father like? Yeah, so if I'm gonna recommend anywhere like in scripture to start reading, I'm not gonna recommend the Old Testament because it can be confusing in terms of uh, why does God decide to do these things in the Old Testament that really, I have a hard time reconciling with my understanding of God as a good father. Yeah. But when I start in the gospels, then I have a more accurate picture, which then I can use to translate everything else that God does uh, throughout the rest of the Bible. And so I think it becomes a filter. So I'm gonna encourage people to start reading through the gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. And I would say not just once, I'd say you read through it several times before you read anything else in scripture if, you're, if your immediate need is to figure out the heart and the nature and character of our heavenly father. But I would also recommend to not do that in isolation. I would say you read your Bible whenever you can, spend some time every day, carve some time out to do that. But I would say you have to be a part of a group of, of believers who together are trying to figure out who this father is. Um, and so that's why we love the idea of a community life group mm -hmm. because it's that communal encouragement that helps you understand and filter what you're reading. So you're not off on an island trying to figure out who this massive God is by yourself. And I think that's the, that's the best place that I would start. And then from there, I would go straight to the rest of the New Testament, reading the, the letters of Paul because yeah. I think in his letters, he represents the heart and the mind of the father uh, in terms of the context of the church. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really powerful thing to do. I, I just wouldn't start with the Old Testament because I think in our context, we need the gospels and we need Jesus uh, to be the filter and the lens to understand who the God of the Old Testament really is. Yeah, and, yeah. and you do see glimpses of grace. Yes. I mean, you mentioned Jonah a, a couple weeks ago or mm -hmm. last week. And, and so in Jonah's story, he's mad because God's so gracious, yeah, you know, and right. you see that, but it's only, it's glimpses. And that's the thing is where you read the gospels, you start realizing this was God's plan. And we didn't live in Jesus's time. So yeah. we have the yeah. luxury, you might say, of reading the gospel and going, oh, 
this is how yeah. we're supposed to interpret everything. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, Courtney, do you have something to add to that? I, I yeah, sure I do. do. Um, absolutely. So focusing on Jesus and the gospels, that's the, that's where we get our salvation. So when you're reading in the gospels and about Jesus's life and what he did for us as sinners, and you can understand the depravity of where I have been at my lowest or just on a normal human day. Um, if I can understand that Jesus went to the cross for me, that shows me the father's love in such an amazing way. And I would also argue just a little bit that um, I agree with going to the gospels and beginning there, but get into the Old Testament too, because the stories are amazing. I just think of the Israelites back in the day and how many times they were stubborn and disobedient and did the wrong thing and didn't follow God, even though he was in an amazing cloud before them. And they got to see all of the the miracles and yet they still defied him and he came back to them again and again and again. So if you can get a whole picture quickly in, in the Bible, um, honestly, my biggest recommendation is to read in the middle, the beginning and the end of the Bible all at the same time. Uh, that's interesting. Go through I like it. That. Yeah. Get in a yeah. plan that's maybe chronological and, uh, yeah, that I takes no you through Genesis that. to right. the end, but is also keeping you in the New Testament and is also keeping you in the Proverbs and the Psalms because these sure. poems and songs that were written to and about him speak of who he is too so beautifully. Yeah, and I don't. Let me, okay, let me clarify. That. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> arguing. No, I know you're not arguing, but I think I think what people I think we owe people some more specifics on what I'm referring. Yes, to. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Because I agree that the Psalms is a beautiful picture of the heart of God that loves to redeem and restore and rescue and mm -hmm. provide for His people. I mean, the big stories of David and Goliath. Oh my goodness, that's beautiful. The story of Daniel in the lion's den, how God saves His people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego mm -hmm. in the fire. It's beautiful. But then you come across these passages and this is what I'm nervous to share with people because there's a certain maturity level that if you're not there, you'll stumble upon some of these passages and it could be a major stumbling block in your faith. Mm -hmm. For example, for example, the prevalent understanding, I just read this this morning, uh, the prevalent understanding of who God is is a judge who loves to be engaged and intervene in the lives of the people so that he can find ways to either bless or judge. Mm -hmm. And so the prevalent understanding of who God is today, and this is based upon uh, a, a survey study done by, I think Baylor University recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that God is someone who is watching very, very closely everything that you do. And when you screw up, there's a whole nother punishment coming your way. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it creates the sense of fear and anxiety about this God. Yeah. And that can be a major stumbling block. In fact, there's Old Testament passages that kind of suggest this, this whole cause and effect, if then kind of relationship. If you do good, you'll be blessed. If you do bad, you'll be cursed. And this is one of the places where God says, um, um, because of the sins of the parents, mm -hmm. um, I will punish your children mm -hmm. to the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. And if I read that for the first time, I'd be like, whoa, what kind of God is that that loves to punish my great grandchildren for my sins? Mm -hmm. And so then I go to the New Testament though, and I read Jesus and there's a couple of different cases where uh, people ask about this very kind of cause and effect, this judgmental kind of God mm. mentality that was still prevalent back in that day. And this is when um, they encounter, Jesus and his disciples encounter a blind guy and, and his disciples ask Jesus, who sinned? Uh, this man's father or mother or himself. And Jesus said, neither his parents or this child, but so that he, the, the glory of God can be displayed in his life. And so Jesus is in a sense, debunking this mentality of God is just out to punish the bad and bless the good. In fact, there's another passage. Well, where, and, and even if that's true, if they were yeah. to take that full, that's yeah. anti-gospel. That's oh, not yeah, what the yeah. gospel teaches oh, because yeah. then it's saying our works like yeah. we've earned our salvation, right? Yeah. So right. Keep, keep going. I'm, no, you're I'm, good. I, yeah, there's another passage where a couple of incidences are referred to Jesus. One is there's this tower in Siloam that fell, mm -hmm. I think killed like 18 people. Um, and there's another scenario I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but basically the question was, you know, why did was God punishing them for their sins? And then Jesus responds by saying, uh, do you think that those who died in those scenarios were worse sinners than everyone else? So, so 
I, I think what I'm trying to say, and again, we're saying the same thing here. I think mm -hmm. we're trying to say is whether you read the Old Testament, New Testament, at the same time chronologically, it's, it's you definitely need Jesus to filter and be the lens to understand the heart of God, not just in the New Testament, but the Old Testament. Yeah. Because we believe that God doesn't change. Yeah. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So his same character that caused him to say those things in the Old Testament that are hard for us to digest it's the same God who's represented in the New Testament. So the, the, the challenge is not there's two different gods. The challenge is how do we reconcile these two different perceptions of God, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, and the way that you reconcile them is in Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about this because yeah. <laughs> I know there's a ton of people who struggle with this, myself included. Yeah. And when I know that I've screwed up somehow, I'm like, all right, when's God gonna judge this? What's mm -hmm. gonna happen? When's that, the hammer going to drop? Exactly. <laughs> In fact, somebody, uh, man, it's super, super sad. Um, about a week ago, I think I mentioned this in first service on Sunday, a week ago, there's um, a family friends. Um, there's a family that were friends of ours while we lived in Richmond, Indiana. Um, and their 18 year old son who was leaving the house to go to a prom party, um, pulled out of the driveway, got hit by a semi and died immediately. Mm. I mean, you're asking the question, how, do, how does that happen? Yeah. I mean, Mm -hmm. And there will be people who at the funeral will talk to the parents and say, uh, you know, uh, who sinned? You or the mm -hmm. wife for God to do this. And, and that's a terrible thing to terrible. say. Right. And, and that's just reality because we have that mentality of God as a judge that is looking for ways to bless when you do good and curse when you do bad. Yeah. Well, and if you take that full circle... Yeah that becomes some type of prosperity gospel. Oh yeah. Like if you give money, you'll have more money or you, you yeah. do this, you'll have what you desire. And then yeah. God becomes a genie almost yeah. for you. So mm -hmm. that can be a real, real big issue. And I think it still is an issue um, in the United States and in the church that sometimes we think if we do this, then God will do this. There's mm -hmm. an equal opposite reaction. And um, I don't think that's how God works at all. <laughs> in fact, when I look at Jesus, he, he doesn't go to the people that actually deserve it. And sometimes he heals people and they don't even say thank you, right? I mean, right. so yeah. That's, yeah. that's pretty crazy. So I, I think overall, what we're trying to say is Jesus is the inter interpretation that we need to walk mm -hmm. through. And John chapter eight is a great way to do that because you look at what he says in John chapter eight and you can see, okay, this is what my heavenly father is like. So there's, there's a major theme you talked about Sunday, Eric. And I, I think we haven't even got to the the major theme, can you believe that? But we just <laughs> talked about a lot. So and good. And so, yes, the major theme we talked about Sunday was there's this accusation against Jesus for being spiritually illegitimate. Like he wasn't the heavenly father's son. And he kept saying, no, if you know my father, you know me. We are, we're together here. We, we can see this. So my question, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with Courtney here. Okay. So how can we overcome that same accusation leveled against us, like that we're spiritually illegitimate. It may come from in here, it may be inside our own heads, or it may be from someone else. Uh, that's a tough one. I do, I do feel like it's something that if we're being honest, we all think from time to time, you know, am I, am I in the word enough? Maybe it's been a couple of days. Um, spiritually illegitimate is, I think, possibly one of the biggest lies that we could hear and believe. But if we know what the truth is, we can quickly combat that. And we can't know that what the truth is without the word of God. So as long as we are being reminded of who we are, again, it comes back to that identity, I think. Um, we have faith. We believe in something we can't see. Like we believe mm -hmm. that we are children of God. So therefore we can't be spiritually illegitimate, but we do need to be reminded. We need to be reminded of who we are. We need to surround ourselves with other believers who can say, no, that's the wrong way to think. I, that's not who you are. So community, yeah. being the word of God. Does that I think you have, to, you have to go back to, yeah. you know, what, what is the nature of feeling that you're illegitimate, whether it's from an earthly father or your heavenly father. And I think the basis of it is that you, you don't feel like you're wanted. I mean, the reason that mm -hmm. your dad would abandon you is because you have the impression at least that they don't want you. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, how do you overcome this sense of I'm not wanted? Yeah. Um, and that can come from a lot of different angles of, of making you feel like you're not wanted. Maybe, maybe it's, I mean, nobody gives you attention. Um, maybe it's, you don't feel like you have 
enough spiritual gifts. You can't really contribute and therefore you're not that much of a player on God's team. And so God doesn't really want you. And if there was a team to be cut from, you would be one of the people that get cut. I mean, how many of us, how many of us hate the feeling in elementary recess when everybody else got picked for the teams and mm-hmm. for kickball and we were the last one. Yeah. I mean, that's a terrible feeling. Yep. Um, and I think some of us feel that way about God. So the question I think is, is how do you overcome this sense that you're not wanted? Um, and I think exactly what you're saying, you've got to get into a community of believers mm-hmm. who then see that sense in you and then can encourage you with, man, God loves you. Yeah. And do you really know what Jesus did for you on the cross? Oh, and by the way, why don't you come over Friday night and hang out? Because we want you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's it's a process of changing the way we see ourselves. Um, not with some self-help books, and not with some you know, um, religious guru stuff. It's more of how do we change the way we see from the influence of the community, but with the gospel truth. Yeah. And I think you hit, it, uh, hit the nail on the head with, with the whole community part. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think it's, it's gotta be both because if it's just one or the other, yeah. it's almost in an echo chamber. Sure. Because mm-hmm. you can have community that's say unhealthy, but then if it's tied to the word of God, it's gonna be healthy. Yeah. And that's how you create healthy relationships is through the word of God and looking at who you are in that. Uh, I, I think one, one thing I, I do wanna add is I think of like, there's an old hymn that says, um, I'm prone to wander, mm. right? And sometimes we can wander into feeling illegitimate or maybe even the word I've heard recently was imposter syndrome. And Eric, you've used that before in a sermon. And so you feel like you're an imposter and yet God's word says, okay, this is who you are and you're believing something else. You're believing Instagram or social media, or you're believing um, what someone said about you, or you're taking a comment that was meant to be positive and attributing it to be negative about yourself. Mm -hmm. Or maybe like you just mentioned earlier, God is judge. So I've mentioned it before. It's like, I can't do anything right. Feeling that feeling from my earthly father made it so that's how I saw God for a long time because I was Mm -hmm. like, I gotta be, I gotta be perfect. I, no one's perfect, but the reality is we all need to pursue and continue to follow Jesus. And that's really what that is. If you're in community and you're in the word, um, the thing, the thing I'm challenged with about this, about being illegitimate is I think that accusation can land and attack us at the moment where we're weakest. So when we're not in the word and we're not in community, um, if we're isolated, um, or we, we think that, Um, We can do it on our own, have a relationship with Jesus on our own. It's really hard to do that. It's impossible because we need to be in community together. And so that's most of the time I've seen it land if it's someone I know or love or care about. Um, Which is interesting you say that because one one of the patterns that I've noticed in people is when they are depressed, when they are discouraged, when they're feeling not wanted, their tendency is to isolate even more. Mm -hmm. And that is the last thing that they should do. Yep. When you are feeling at your worst, what you need to do is engage more in the church because that's where, in a sense, the life raft is going to come from. Um, and then once you isolate, you just make yourself more of a target. Yeah. So and it's, it it's essentially counterintuitive. You have to, to you have to yeah. press in. Maybe, yeah. that's, maybe that's a good, or you talked about the church being on the offense. It's like, you have to be offensive with your, your desire to isolate. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're, if you know, that's your tendency, you got to work against that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the Holy spirit allows you to do that. There was one other thing you mentioned Sunday that I thought was very curious. You mentioned becoming, uh, bitter from the accusation that we hear about our illegitimacy. So like the fact that we could become bitter towards God because we feel illegitimate. Like there's this distance between us and God. Mm -hmm. And although it sounds like it's artificial, right? Because God didn't move, we did. And so how, how can we, what, what's on this long road from being bitter, bitter against God or the bitterness we might have to trust and faith in our heavenly father? Because we start with some bitterness. Like uh, I'll, I'll just give you a personal example. Like I remember, and I've shared this on the, the podcast before, but um, I remember the moments after my dad passed away and I've shared this at church and I was pretty angry. Like, and there was some bitterness, like, God, why would you do this? And then within minutes, the Holy Spirit gave me peace and allowed me to see a bigger picture of what God was doing in that. So that was a very short road, (laughs) but I think there's a longer road for most of us where there's a point in our life where we're angry at God or our families hurt us and they did it in the name of God, we think you did. So how do we, what's on that long road? That's a good question. I want to clarify something, but I'm actually going to redirect the question to Courtney. (laughs) Oh, okay. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so so what I said is that <clears throat> the process of, of 
feeling illegitimate, I think is, is something of a four-phased process where one phase morphs into the next. And I do need to clarify that this is not official uh, psychologist language. Um, I'm not a, a psychologist or a yeah. counselor. And so I'm not going to say that this is dogma in terms of the psychological world. This is based primarily on some things that I've read, but also things that I've observed in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And it begins... Um, by, by still feeling and believing that your father, whether it's your earthly father or heavenly father is good and still loves you, you just don't understand yet that they've abandoned you. Um, but then that, that desire to want to believe in your father's goodness and love morphs into this kind of religious legalism, if it's with your heavenly father, but this kind of relational legalism, if it's with your earthly father, in trying to convince yourself that you are lovable and that your father needs to love you and give his attention to you. Um, and I think that lasts for a couple of years trying to, because it doesn't make sense. Why is he gone? Mm -hmm. Why has he abandoned me if he in fact does love me? So you try to prove it to yourself. Mm -hmm. But then I think that morphs into that bitterness that you were talking about. We're like, you know, nothing that I do is gonna work. And so apparently it's just who I am. And so now you're just frustrated that all of your friends, their fathers are still with them and loves them and, and your father's gone. And then I think that eventually just to remind everybody morphs into, I guess I'm just illegitimate and I'm gonna survive this world without my father, whether it's the earthly father or the heavenly father. And so with that kind of, again, clarification, I'm not a trained or expert and I'm not gonna say that's dogmatic psychology. <laughs> Um, but what I want to do is... But I could is, see that. My experience would be the same. Eric. Yeah. So like, yeah. I mean, just seeing that progression. Absolutely. how it happens. Yeah. And so here's what I want to redirect to you. So uh, we all know families whose father has left the family mm -hmm. and abandoned the kids. Uh, what have you observed is the way that these kids show their bitterness to their father? Oh my goodness. Um, you, you just dropped a deep one. <laughs> that's, that's, woo. that's deep. Yeah, no, I feel like um, how the kids have observed, how I've observed kids who um, they develop a disrespect for authority. Is this kind of where we're going? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah um, a disrespect for authority, extremely independent, um, definitely bitter and angry and then just trying to fill that hole that's inside them with anything else in the world that they can mm -hmm. um yeah it's a tough one to have those abandonment issues or um even just the, the deep deep pain i think that they just turn to the wrong things to try to fill that and then they uh, puff themselves up to be the one who fulfills all their own needs and that sort of thing. So uh, that's what I've observed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So several different ways of illicit behavior. Yes. So what I'm hearing you oh, say yeah. is the converse of that is that a father that is present, mm -hmm. uh, that is engaged mm -hmm. and attentive. Yeah is a major deterrent and a protection from all kinds of illicit behavior Absolutely. from their kids. Absolutely, because okay. we have to be able to submit to authority to yeah. really get anywhere in this world or else we'll end up in prison mm -hmm. or jobless and um, really to just be a healthy citizen that contributes sure. to life. Yeah. So from I, I was children on up. Just reading about this recently and they found uh, statistically, they were mm -hmm. talking about two parent homes, single parent homes, mm -hmm. and something that really wasn't out there, put out there, was single parent homes where the father is the single parent mm. had the same lack of incarcerated kids. It was like it was like only ten percent of kids were incarcerated at some point. Mm. Same with two parent homes, single parent homes. It was like eighty yeah. percent that was a mother. So it was a father. So if, if the father's in the picture, and I really think some of that there's some profound things that happen when our relation with our father is broken mm -hmm. and it, our relation with our heavenly father, when that's broken, it's really broken. Like that's mm -hmm. on a deeper level. And so mm -hmm. I can't say that that's not even like what you're saying. I'm like, yep. Yeah. Yep. And it's, it's a challenge for me as a father to one, be present, but also um, have spiritual influence, you might mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. on my children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very blessed and thankful for my kids and like how they interact. But there's times where I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, my kids aren't, aren't acting the way I, I want, but I'm starting to realize that those moments that they're not acting the way I want are a teachable yeah. moment. Yeah. But if I wasn't there, they wouldn't be taught anything. 
Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. being present with um, the Father. L- l- let, me, um, uh, l- l- let me respond to that. And then also I want to ask the same question to you okay. um, as, as the women's ministry lead here, because okay. the statistics that you just mentioned, I, I'm not disagreeing with. Yeah. I think they're very true. And um, society has proven that. Th- there is something that's imbued in the father that has a massive impact on the family and the community, yeah. whether by their presence or by their absence. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not denying that. The reality is at Brookside and in every church, there's a significant population of single mothers. Yeah, I, and I, I'm I not saying that, yeah. Oh, I don't disagree. And I'm not saying yeah. that you were, you know, um, in a sense trying to, to make them feel like, oh no, this woe is me in a sense of like, because I'm a single mother in home, there's no father in the home, that there's like a huge percentage chance my kid's gonna become a delinquent. No. I know you're not saying that, but I imagine that there are single mothers who have, if they have been exposed to those statistics, have felt that way in some way. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, on a very practical basis, how can we encourage our single mothers um, to, to have confidence in their children's future as opposed to, well, statistically speaking, they're gonna be, uh, you know, they're gonna be delinquents, you know? So I'm, I'm wondering how we do that. And I've got some thoughts, but um, being a mother yourself, mm-hmm. how would you respond to that? How do we encourage our single mothers from having such a, a, a terrible, destructive, uh, low confidence view of their children's future right. if there's no father in or the like home. like a looming statistic. Yeah, that absolutely. trying to yeah. avoid. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I am sitting here uh, between two dads as a mom mm-hmm. and, you know, not everyone has a dad. And so mm-hmm. it's, I can only imagine how heavy that must weigh on the single moms. And I can't speak to that directly because my kids do have a dad. Um, but I feel like moms have as much of a responsibility to their children to have grace like the father has for us with the children. And I do think that even moms can break generational curses in their families. So point them in the direction of the church and to Jesus and get in groups and um, really just be in the word constantly. I, I know that's always my answer for everything, but you get to be an example to your children as a mom. Um, Practically speaking, you can get involved with friends who have husbands who are willing to play with the kids and just kind of be an example or a role model. You just need to be intentional. And and I don't think anything in this life is uh, promised to anyone, whether married or not. You seek out what would be best for your children. So you're saying that that if, if there's single mothers in our audience mm-hmm. listening to this right mm-hmm. now, outside of hastily getting married perhaps to the wrong person mm-hmm. just so that there can be a father figure in a home mm-hmm. or perhaps having a live-in boyfriend, which we wouldn't recommend. There's a way for their, their children to have something of a positive father figure influence mm-hmm. while yet still have being a single mother home. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I'm saying you're doing a great job if that's you. Um, you just keep pointing to Jesus and you get in community and you come to the church, maybe have your children sit in the front row and listen to Pastor Eric. Mine are laughing at him all the time. (laughs) Um, And just keep doing it. Keep plugging along and praying. And yeah, don't rush to get married just to fill a hole because that could very easily be the wrong peg for that hole. Well, and I... I didn't state that to be discouraging because I think there's encouragement from scripture the yeah. opposite way. Because when you look at Timothy, I believe it was Timothy, talks about his mother and grandmother. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it says, those are the ones that led him in faith. Mm-hmm. So really the impact is that eternal, every mother can have. Mm-hmm. And so like, yeah. mm-hmm. I, 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 I would tell you this. So this is like kind of a, a little humbling is, you know, if mom was gone for this women's retreat this last weekend, the moment she gets home, I'm like chopped liver. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And so kids naturally need their mother. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of situations where that's not the case or it's the other way around. But the reason I, I do, I, I said that was also to say that we should encourage in every way that there's men and women in the church that can mentor our children, spend mm-hmm. time with our children. And I, I've learned that most of my mentors are actually not my dad. Mm-hmm. Like, in fact, my dad passed away over 10 years ago. And so in that time span, it's like all of a sudden I'm going to have no spiritual growth because 
I decided that way. Again, I was an adult, but still, mm -hmm. I mean, and I think it's the same with children. I think, yes, events like that are impactful, but I think it's almost worse um, if you're in a family where the father or mother is present, like physically there, but is absent emotionally mm -hmm. or absent in their parenting. Mm -hmm. So I think that can be more damaging than not having a father, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if that yeah. makes sense. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. For sure. And, and the reason that we're, we're kind of uh, talking more specifically about our earthly father relationships is because I think that's the way that we understand our heavenly father's relationship. Mm -hmm. And if our earthly fathers were absent and abandoned and dismissive, then it's very easily going to convince us that our heavenly father is that way too. And so we'll have the same process. It's we'll step into that religious legalism to try to convince God that, you know, we are lovable and we deserve your attention. And when that doesn't work, we'll get bitter at him and we'll start mm -hmm. to do religious religiously illicit mm -hmm. behavior mm -hmm. to say, well, if he's not going to pay attention, I guess I can do whatever I want to. And he's not going to care. Right. Right. Just and like our children do oh, sometimes. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I, I think, I think it, it's very valuable to talk about both uh, illegitimacy from an earthly standpoint, but also a spiritual standpoint, because I think there's a whole lot of similarities between them. Yeah. So Eric, I, I had one thought that I think ties us all together in the take it home. You said one thing that I was like, hey, can you unpack this more? Because I listened to the sermon and I thought to myself and I listened to it again and I thought, hmm, he's got more to say here. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want Courtney to add something to this, but first maybe you said, don't let Satan change you from a child to a survivor. Unpack the survivor. I get the child part, but I don't get the survivor. Like when I hear survivor, I think of a positive thing. Like I'm a survivor, I'm not gonna give up. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. Stop with the singing, right? So, but I think of a positive thing and the context that you were putting it in, uh -huh. it was like, think of yourself as a child of God. Positive, yeah. ultimate positive, Yeah. not just a survivor. So can you, yep. can you share some more about that? Absolutely. So the survivor um, mentality is, is really the last phase, the fourth phase in this whole process of, um, of illegitimacy. And when I think of survivor, I know that, I know that our culture kind of romanticizes survivorship. Uh, and there are certain scenarios and um, circumstances where survivorship is a very noble thing, especially if you're lost out in the middle of nowhere and you learn how to survive. And that's really cool. I mean, there's all kinds of, there's an entire industry for gear you can buy so that you can survive. You know, um, if you are a single mother and the father's abandoned you, there's, you in a sense have to survive financially, economically, relationally. I mean, just with your time, you're gonna be going from 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. and then you're gonna do it all over again the next, you have to survive. Mm -hmm. In this context, I'm not referring to the romanticized version of it. What I'm referring to is the fact uh, that as a mentality, it's you think that you're all alone and you feel like nobody is there to help you. Uh, there's nobody else to depend on. And if you're going to live, it's gonna be fully on you. And that is actually anti-gospel. The gospel is, no, no, you can't survive on your own. You have to have the blood of Jesus to not just be saved, but you need his Holy Spirit to live every day the godly life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when we step into a spiritual survivorship mode, what we do is we say, all right, what do I have to do to get to heaven just to survive and get there? And it's, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do all the religious things. Um, and I'm just going to forget about God. Or I'm going to say, you know, heaven doesn't even matter anymore. And I'm going to be responsible for um, giving me as much of my version of heaven as I can. And so I'm going to make as much money as I can, even if I have to stab people in the back, because that's where happiness is going to come from. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if my marriage is blown apart, why should I live this very short life with somebody that I don't even like anymore? So kick her to the curb or kick him to the curb and go find someone 20 years younger that you can just have fun with, you know? And so there's all kinds of outlets for this survivor mentality. And I think that comes when you do not believe anymore that God is your provider. Um, that in him, you have a peace that surpasses understanding. Yeah. That in him, you have hope. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not really where you wanna go. Well, and Courtney, before you respond, one of the things that you just said that I thought about is also you are a child of God, meaning you're one of many mm -hmm. and we're in this together yeah. versus the child of God. Sometimes we have a self-centered, like a survivor mindset is almost self-focused rather than community focused or, or the church focused or even focused on a relation with God. Like we can't have a relationship if we're just closed off and think we're going to written, oh, I'm going to survive. I think the mentality in the United States, they, they used to talk, call it, uh, call it uh, pulling you up from your bootstraps, mm -hmm. you know, 
And I think that like has ingrained our culture so that we think we need to be survivors. And it has been romanticized. I love that you said that word because I think it's yeah. it's romantic. It's like, oh, I'm going to be a survivor. Mm-hmm. It's a mentality. It's a good thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Courtney, you got other thoughts? Yeah. Um, I just, I love that. I, I think you said it. Don't let Satan change you from a child to a survivor. But I think you also said, don't let Satan change your story. Mm-hmm. And I think so long as we are root, we know that our, who we are is rooted in what who God says he is and he is with us. We're not surviving on an island by ourselves. We don't have to pick up our bootstraps because we, we are dependent on him and not dependent on ourselves. So we get to choose, are we going to think of ourselves as a child of God, the heir that you talked about recently, or are we going to think about ourselves as, wow, I really, like, I really did it. I pulled it off. I, I survived and look at me now. So it's in our thinking. I feel like I just want to say we get to, we get to choose what we think. So are we going to dwell on the fact that we survived whatever it was that we survived? Because we all go through really hard things. Mm -hmm. So are we going to think like the Lord helped me through that and I am a child of God or are we going to think, and I I have been fiercely independent in my life. So I feel like I'm speaking from experience for sure. Sure. So one of the promises that Jesus um, was very clear with, he says, I have come to give you life and life to the full. Mm -hmm. A full life does not sound like surviving to me. Mm -hmm. Surviving sounds like I've got the bare minimum of life just before I die, you know? Um, and that's not the way that God wants us to live. And I'm not saying that that means you have as much money as you want or all the lake houses or the beach condos. What I'm saying is that uh, there is the Holy Spirit giving you life, giving you peace and joy that you can't get anywhere else. And so um, I recognize the temptation in some of us to become spiritual survivors, but that's not where Jesus wants us. That's definitely not what he died uh, is to just help us survive. Yeah, that's well, and, not the abundant life. That's exactly And, right. and to mm-hmm. comment on both of this, one of the things I, I just heard, and I think it's very true, is independence is the opposite of intimacy. And we can't have mm. intimacy with Jesus mm-hmm. if we think we're completely independent mm-hmm. from him. Mm-hmm. So our relationship with others, we can't, we can't get close to someone and be in relationship with someone if we're just like, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to be completely dependent. And we do that with when we think, we can work our way to heaven or we can work our way this way. Mm-hmm. That's, that's that religious, illegitimate kind of like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to church more. So now all of a sudden Jesus likes me. Mm-hmm. Well, if we, we have a relationship with that, like that, like we're always gonna end up unsatisfied and it's not gonna be that abundant life at all. So y- you ended, you ended everything with I think a phrase that almost summarizes the whole sermon and summarizes like what we were discussing about illegitimacy, the closer the relationship, the stronger the confidence. Mm. So I think we've talked a lot about getting into that relationship, um, sticking with the relationship, um, being a legitimate child of God rather than an illegitimate child. But maybe, maybe let's dig a little deeper. So how can we be close to Jesus. What does that mean practically? I think both of you can answer this and I'll add a couple thoughts, but um, how can we be closer to Jesus? I mean, I get that the, this confidence is stronger with more relationship, but if we're completely independent and that's what we were struggling with, then how do we become less independent and more focused on Jesus? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, okay, I'll go. Um, <laughs> just sit and be like in our world, we are just going, 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 or we're filling our time with sounds, just be with Jesus. So I think practically speaking, you have to just sit and set that time aside to just um, be with Jesus in your thoughts, maybe have worship music on that's directing your thoughts to God. Um, Obviously be in the word and read, learn more, but if we don't prioritize and say, like we fill our days with appointments, right? Where, where our time priority needs to be is with God and with Jesus. So that's, it's difficult when you're busy or you wake up and you have to get children up and get them ready for school and they get ready for work. But our priority needs to be with Jesus. So let's take a step back before we go to Eric, but mm-hmm. single mom, super busy. Mm-hmm. And I really care about my kids and I want them to spiritually grow. Like, 
do you have to start with you or is it, you know, I'm going to still it in the kids, so I'm going to talk with the kids? Oh, you for sure have to start with yourself. You okay. have to be in relationship with Jesus and you have to commune with him. And that's what, that's what the community is too. You're with God in your thoughts. It's not, it doesn't have to be the, the room is perfectly silent. I have a burning candle. I have comfort in my couch. Like it is a constant. I'm just, I almost, a, I almost laughing because that's not what I picture. Do you burn candles? No, but no, I, no, maybe, people don't do. burn any so candles. Maybe that's, <laughs> you're right. That's a woman thing. Like, like, they want to have everything. Like they don't want to look up and see the laundry is still there and the dishes are undone. Totally agree. And they want to get all of their to do's done so that they can then get to God, but like God is there first and he's in it. And while we're washing those dishes, we're with him. And when we're folding that laundry, we're with him. So it's, it's a constant awareness that Jesus is with me. Mm-hmm. And that that, that, that's a perfect answer because it's more than just having a half an hour of devotional time mm-hmm. in the morning before you go into your day. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. recognizing that he is with you and mm-hmm. he's inviting you to bring him into mm-hmm. every decision, if it's micro decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in especially in the context of the family that we're talking about, especially with an absentee father, um, I think if it's just the single mother or, or if there's a family where both the, the father and the mother are in the home, um, then you need to display to your kids how you are communicating. If mm-hmm. they never see you read your Bible, that's a problem. Mm-hmm. If they never hear you pray, that's a problem. If they never... Uh, if, if you never help them walk through the way you made a decision, that's a problem mm-hmm. because they need to see that stuff. And, and when I come to, um, when you ask that question, mm-hmm. my mind went to John 15, where Jesus is very clear about the nature of the vine and the branches. Mm-hmm. He says this, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me, I will remain in him. Um, apart from me, he says, you can do nothing. So the idea is there's this constant flow of your needs to him and his resources to you. Um, and the moment you begin to distance yourself from Jesus, that's the moment you begin to separate from the vine. And that's an unhealthy thing to do. Yeah. Well, and what you just mentioned is a, is a humbling process yeah. because if we're receiving resources and our needs are going out, really, we can't do anything to repay Jesus. Mm-hmm. I mean, we really can't. I mean, yes, we can We can do everything in our power to love him and care for him, yeah. but the reality is he's doing that for us. And so I, I loved what you guys shared today. This has been so amazing yeah. just to kind of go through uh, John chapter eight and talk about our relationship as legitimate children of God. And I think that's what's so important is if you're watching this, think about the fact that you are a legitimate child of God when you pursue Jesus and you pursue him, as, as Courtney, as you said, just in every moment almost. Mm-hmm. And know he's present with you. And uh, I, I'm just thankful that we're going through this series. And the name does scare me a little bit. You've said that, like, it's worthless. What? But the real reality is, in Jesus, we are worthwhile. And so that's what's really important um, as we kind of close this Church Unscripted. Um, come and be with us these next few weeks because we're going to be talking about this same series. Um, I'm excited about Sunday and the following weeks, um, what we're going to discuss. But uh, hit the like button. Uh, Make sure you subscribe. You can get the notifications if you hit the bell. Um, And we will see you next week on Church Unscripted.